As you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter number 5, we have begun uh, studying through the book of Acts, and what we are interested in is what is the church all about? And if we do not know the answer, uh, we hope that the reply would say, well, if I don't know, I need to look at the Word of God and see how the first century church was interacting what they did, what was the message of that church, and then say, whatever the message of the church was in the first century, that's what the message of the church needs to be in the 21st century. Amen. And here we find ourselves in the 21st century, and it is clear that the church landscape has greatly changed, the agenda of the church has greatly changed. And so I pray and hope that our desire is that we be a first century church, and that we be first century Christians. And I pray that that is your desire this morning. If you take your Bibles, notice Acts chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 17 in just a moment. If you remember at the beginning of chapter number 5, Ananias and Sapphira uh, hypocritically brought an offering before the apostles. They brought a portion of the money that they sold their land for, and it was not the complete possession. They um, deceived the church. Uh, they attempted to... Uh, portray themselves as doing something that they really did not do. And we find a really um, gripping event that takes place in that church where Ananias and Sapphira both died. And the Bible says that there was great signs and wonders that were done by the apostles in that first century. And I explained that two weeks ago in the message, the reasons for signs and wonders. And it is important for us to understand why were the miracles done in the first century. And I hope that we received a clear explanation. We begin now in verse 17. Based upon all that was happening in the church, the people who were on the outside of the church did not like what was happening inside the church. And notice what happens, verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. Now, just to pause for a moment, the Sadducees were a group of people who considered themselves religious but they did not believe in the supernatural. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in miracles. And so now they have a problem because in the first century church, they're seeing the apostles bringing about miracles. And the Bible says, verse 17, they were filled with indignation. That word could mean, if you would, they were very zealous, they were very jealous of them. They were so angry of what was going on in the church. Verse 18, And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison door and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught, but the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. What a surprise. <laughs> then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. 
I would like to bring your attention earlier to verse 20. And if you go back there, the angel comes to the apostles and he says, tells them to do this, verse 20, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. I want to bring your attention to that expression, all the words of this life. And so I would like to preach a message that I've entitled, All the Words of This Life. Now, as we look at here the first century church, it is evident that as we studied back in Romans or Acts 4, we saw the first persecution of the church. What is interesting to note is that the first persecution of the church happened at the hand of the religious people of the day. Uh, namely, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests and the people who made up, if you would, the local authorities of that day. And as we come to Acts chapter number 5, we find that the high priests and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the trouble they had was with the message. They did not like the fact that Peter and John were preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you remember back in the first persecution, what they told them not to do is stop teaching and preaching in his name. You can do whatever you want to do, but don't mention Jesus Christ. As we come to Acts chapter 5, we see here that Peter and John obviously did not listen. Uh, they kept going and preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see here in verse 33 of Acts 5, uh, they had told them, or back in verse 28, did we not command you to stop teaching in his name? Stop mentioning Jesus Christ. And so we find by verse 33 that they were conspiring and talking how they could slay them. You know what that means? They wanted to kill them. How? Can we legally get rid of those people who are teaching and preaching about Jesus Christ? Now, the reason why I say all those things, as we look at this record, I'm interested in what the angel says to Peter, to, to Peter and John for them to do. They're sitting there in prison. The angel comes and he says, I want you to go to the temple and I want you to speak all the words of this life. And so we find that that's exactly what Peter and John... now. Uh, the, all the words of this life we're going to find concerns Jesus Christ. So they go to the temple to preach those words. But what I'm interested in is as a church, we are here in the 21st century, and things are constantly changing, and we must be very uh, aware of how things are changing, often not for the good. And I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in churches. There are two ways that I would like to approach this expression we find in verse 20 of Acts 5. First of all, what do these words mean to us personally? And then secondly, what do these words mean with regard to the church? Now, first of all, let me consider what these words mean to us personally. The Bible says here, uh, the angel says to Peter and John to go, stand and Speak. Now notice here that nowhere were the apostles commanded to go out and do miracles, but they were commanded over and over again to speak the name of Jesus Christ, to preach the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they did. And so we ask ourselves here all the words of this lives. I want to ask ourselves this question this morning. Do we know why we are here? I'm not talking about in church. I'm talking about while you're here on earth, while you're alive, while you are breathing at this very moment. Do you know why you're here? Do you know what life is all about? Or in your estimation, in your thinking, do you think that this life is just about, well, we just live and then that's it. We're kind of... Uh, just animals uh, living our lives kind of in a rat reel, and one day we die, and that's it. And I tell you that there's a greater purpose than that. Life is much more than that. I was uh, reading an article that was written by Neil Burton, who is a doctor in psychiatry. He is a philosopher from Oxford, England. He wrote an article entitled, What is the Meaning of Life? And so I thought to myself, well, let me read this article and see what he says about what this life is all about. He wrote this article in March 3rd of 2018. And in the article, he says something like this. 
having no purpose at all is better than having a kind of predetermined purpose. Now, what he's saying is to have no purpose is better than have, according to the Word of God, a predetermined purpose set forth by the Word of God. He goes on to say, in short, even if God exists, and even if He had an intelligent purpose in creating us, and why should He have one? We do not know what this purpose might be. And whatever it might be, we would rather be able to do without it. Or at least ignore or discount it. He goes on and he quotes Plato, uh, once defined man as simply this, a being in search of meaning. Now that's interesting because he says there is no meaning to life. But they said that's what a uh, human being is. A uh, human being is someone who is in search of meaning, but never finds it. According to Frankel, meaning can be found through, and he kind of summarizes in three ways. He says this, this is the meaning of life, experiencing reality without the environment, or, or with the environment and with others. That's the meaning of life. Giving something back to the world through creativity and self-expression and changing our attitude when faced with situations or circumstances that we cannot change. Now, look, if those, th those things may be good things to do, but that has nothing to do with the meaning of life. Absolutely nothing. And so when I uh, go and I want to read this, read this article that says, what is the meaning of life? The summary of the article is, there is no meaning to life. That's interesting. As we read those words, they are very, uh, they are, uh, very important with regards to us personally. All the words of this life, the first century church was concerned to tell people all the words of this life. What is life all about? What is your existence all about? But then I want us to go at another angle, and that is what do these words mean with regard to the church? What is the church? What does the church do? What is the message of the church? Again, I'm going online and I'm searching for those things and I came across the Central Maryland Ecumenical Council in which they have a mission statement on their website, so I'm not making it up, this is their own website, and they say this, the Central Maryland and Ecumenical Council is a Christian community seeking to make the beloved community both visible and real. We seek to do this advocating on behalf of any environmental, racial, social, and or economic issue which does not affirm the imago dei of all persons regardless of race, gender, ethnic background, or socioeconomic status. We invite you to learn more about what it means to be a member of the Central Maryland Ecumenical Council community. They go on to say, to become a member, um, become a member, congregation, and support the work of Central Maryland Ecumenical Council. They said, your congregants or this congregation membership added to that of your colleagues throughout Baltimore City and the counties west of the Chesapeake. Our work includes this. So this is the work of this group of churches that have come together. This is what they're involved in doing. Number one, to bring together Christian congregations to share, pray, and work together. Launching the Congregation Restoration Creation Program that organizes the Awake and Arise Climate Justice Conference. Climate Justice Conference. I don't even know what that means. And has worked with denominations and congregations to increase the earth care practices, sustainability, and advocacy. Working with ecumenical leader groups of Maryland to successfully repeat the, repeal the death penalty, pass the DREAM Act, and the Gun Safety Act of 2013, and to further even stronger clear energy legislation. Organizing ongoing education programs such as the CMEC Luncheon Series, the focus on healthcare, poverty, violence, environmental stewardship, and faith-based organizing, training in the practice of non-violence and congregational organizing. He goes on to say, membership for a congregation is $100, but please consider a larger contribution. By joining, you support and strengthen the council's effort to bring the faith community together on issues of common concern. Again, they repeat, membership of a congregation is $100, but please consider a large contribution. 
Who is part of this council? Let me list it for you. The Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, the United Church of Christ, the Quakers, the, the United Methodist Church, Christian Science, the Presbyterian Church, the Catholic Church, and Baptist churches. Now you may pause here and say, well, what's the big deal? I'll tell you what the big deal is. The agenda of this ecumenical group has nothing to do with what the Word of God says the church is supposed to do. The church of the first century had a clear message. And that clear message was the gospel of Jesus Christ. All the words of this life, what is life about? And what has happened here today in the 21st century, which started happening really in the mid 1800s, the church has brought in some social agenda that has nothing to do with the gospel. And what the message of the church is, is a message of the gospel that will change your life socially. You see, the gospel is not a message of social change. The gospel message is something that will change your life. The uh, message of the church is not how the church can change the world and how the, we can make the world a better place. The gospel message is how you can be saved from your sins. And the church today in the 21st century, all of those churches have lost the message of the church. They're involved in everything else, and I believe that the dictates of their behavior and their work has been molded and shaped by the world. As we come here to Acts chapter number 5, the angel says to Peter and John, verse 20, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Now the account we read here is quite remarkable. And before I go into the message, I want to give us here an understanding of what was happening. Peter and John and the apostles were going around clearly preaching the gospel based upon Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 2. The message was pretty clear. Jesus Christ came, he died to pay for your sin debt so that you can receive the remission and the forgiveness of sins. And that is the message of the gospel. And so here the high priest, the people who are in rule, the people who are in authority, they put their hands on them and they put them, according to the Bible in verse number 18, in the common prison. Why? Because they were filled with indignation. Now what is interesting today, we are in the 21st century, and people come and say, well here, you don't understand, Pastor, we are in the 21st century, and now that we are in the 21st century, you've got smarter. We understand things. We understand science. You know, uh, the uh, idea of believing the Bible and being religious and uh, kind of believing what the Bible says, that's kind of archaic. Uh, you know, today the reason why the world is unbelieving is because we are, after all, in the 21st century, are we not? And I say to us, to everyone, that the idea of being unbelieving is not a new idea at all. It's as old as the gospel. You see, the first unbeliever, unbelievers were fined the first time the gospel was preached, they did not believe. They rejected. And I want you to think here, because today the appeal in the 21st century is you have those people who consider themselves scholars and philosophers who says, we don't need the church, we don't need Christianity, we don't need any of those things. We've now, we understand things, uh, we have grown in those things, uh, but uh, the, the, the mark of unbelief, it is interesting, uh, which is the first point this morning, is we find the irrationality of the unbelieving critics. People look at the church and believers and say, oh, those are irrational people. Look at that. They believe that God can forgive them of their sin. They believe that God can, uh, can change their lives. They believe in life after death. How ridiculous are all those things? And they say that these believers are irrational. But as we study the Word of God, if you know anything about uh, world history, you're going to find that the irrational ones are rather those who are the unbelieving critics. In this chapter alone, who are the ones throwing who in prison? The unbelievers are grabbing a hold of Peter and John and they're putting them in the prison. Why? There was some indignation about them. The word in verse 17 says, for they were filled with indignation. They could not stand the message that Peter and John were preaching. There was a jealousy about them. Why? Because these were the people, the high priests and all the Sadducees. You know who these people were? They were the 
political authoritative class in that day. And they looked down on the common people. They said to the common people, you need us. You need to follow us. You need to listen. We've been to schools. We've been trained. We've been to seminaries. We know better than you. And so you need to come and you need to follow us. We have the answers for you. And based upon Acts chapter 4, here comes Peter and John, who, by the way, were just simple fishermen. And the Bible tells us, if you go back to chapter 4, notice what it says about them in verse number 13. The Bible says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You see, the ruling class of that day, they couldn't stand that Peter and John were unlearned and ignorant. Now, you wonder what that means. It doesn't mean they were stupid. It means that they weren't trained like these people educated over here. We know better than the common people. The people over here, they know nothing. And you need us to tell you how to live your life and how to think because you can't think for yourself. And so they couldn't stand that here are two men who were simply grew up, whose trade was fishing, but now uh, they were unlearned and ignorant. But then something is special about them. The Bible says they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. In other words, something tells us about Peter and John is before Jesus Christ was crucified, Jesus Christ also spoke. He also had a message, and his message was quite clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And now Peter and John show up and says, Jesus Christ is the redemption of the world. And so they're saying that's the same message, and we don't want that message. And these people are ignorant, they're foolish. And so here we find here the irrationality of the unbelieving critics. Back in Acts chapter 4, they threatened them. They beat them. And they said, don't speak in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. And so I tell you and ask you this question, who is irrational? In chapter 5, it's not the believers, it's the unbelievers. The Bible goes on to say, they laid their hands on them, verse 18, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison door and brought them forth and said, and here is uh, uh, why they were delivered, verse 20, to stand and speak. So we ask ourselves here today, what is the church supposed to do. And I say, we don't have to make up anything. We have to look here in Acts chapter 5 and say, we know exactly what the church is supposed to do. The church is supposed to stand up and speak. Say, why, why do you all have meetings? Why do you stand up and preach and teach and do all those things? I'll tell you why, because that's what we're commanded to do. We are commanded to speak, and here he says, all the words of this life, verse 21. And when they had heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning, and they taught. They did exactly what God told them to do. But the high priest came, and they were with him, and called the council together. So uh, this is a, an amazing picture in the story. So Peter and John there are in the prison. They're locked up. There's two guards, or not two, it just says guards, that were outside of the prison. And so they're in the prison, and they're locked up. They can't preach or teach in the name of Jesus Christ, so they're all happy. The next morning, we see the angel uh, uh, brings them out. Peter and John are actually in the temple preaching and preaching, uh, preaching and teaching Jesus Christ. In another part of the temple, somewhere else, there was another meeting going on. The authorities were having a meeting, and they were thinking together, what are we going to do with these people? Verse 21, and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to them, the, the, the expression senate means the rulers, the people in authority. They couldn't stand the message about Jesus Christ. And they said, and said to the prison to have them brought. And so here is, uh, think, you see that image? In one part of the, the temple, probably in the outer courts, they had this meeting with all the religious people, all the authorities, and they were thinking to themselves, what are we going to do with them? You know what? Let's bring them forward to us. While they didn't know at the exact same time, they were in the temple preaching and teaching the people. And so they are sent over. The people go over to the prison. And notice what the Bible says, verse 22. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly was found. We shut, uh, shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the door. So you know what that means? It says the door was locked. The men were outside of the prison door, the guards, but when we had opened, we found no man within. H how did this happen? Verse 24, and when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. And they came one and told them, saying, you see here, so here they're wondering, well, how is that possible? They were put in prison, the door was locked, there was guard outside, 
Where do they go? And then someone runs at that time. It says, they're in the temple teaching and preaching. <laughs> That's what they had been doing that they were taken away from. And the Bible says, in verse 25, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people as they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? So I want you to think about that. When we read earlier in verse 20, Go and speak all the words of this life, we know what that message was about because then they said, didn't we tell you not to teach and preach in his name? So what is the message of this life? It's Jesus Christ. And behold, ye have, here is, I love that verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Uh, so uh, you see here, the irrationality of the unbelieving critics, they tried the threats, it didn't stop them. They put him in prison, it didn't stop them. Then we read later in verse 33, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So now, just like for the Lord Jesus Christ, they're conspiring, they're talking among themselves, how can we rid ourselves of those people? How can we kill them? Well, we are in the 21st century, and... Certainly, there are a number of countries where those who preach the gospel are silenced. Whether it is because of physical opposition, or whether it is mockery, or uh, it is the attempt to silence the preaching and the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so what we notice in our text in Acts chapter 5, we see the irrationality of the unbelieving critics. The truth is, nowhere do you find in the New Testament uh, books of the Bible, nowhere do you find in the New Testament where the church is commanded to go and to force people, to put people into prison, and to exercise violence. Nowhere is that found. The message of the church is, here is a wonderful message, the gospel message, that you can have eternal life in the person of Jesus Christ. You don't have to do anything. It is a voluntary gift that you can accept by faith. And God will change your life. And yet the critics on the outside says, be quiet, silence, we don't want to hear that message. We don't want to hear about Jesus Christ that is preposterous, that's ridiculous, to speak in his name. And I say to you, the world is still saying that it is preposterous and ridiculous to speak of the name of Jesus Christ. But the truth is, the true church will never cease to do that. The ecumenical movement and all those churches joining forces to get together some social agenda are entirely missing what they're supposed to be doing. So we see the irrationality of the unbelieving critics, but secondly, we see the instruction from the unlearned Christians. And I use the term unlearned Christians not to ridicule them, but to use the expression that the uh, religious uh, uh, authorities of that day refer to them as. They are unlearned and ignorant men. And if that means that people take notice that we have been with Jesus, I'll take that title. As a matter of fact, the title Christian was not a title that we chose for ourselves. It was what those who persecuted the Christian called them all. Oh, those are Christians. It was actually a curse word. It was a way to curse somebody. Ah, oh, you're a Christian. And so we find the instruction from the unlearned Christians. The message here, verse 20, I'd like to focus on verse 20 again. It says, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. This message of life, about life, does not begin with Peter and John. You know, it's not like a group of people uh, got together one day and sat and had a board meeting and says, hey, uh, what can we do as a church? What can we be involved in? What is, what is the... Uh, social agenda of this first century. No, they had a message that came from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you go back with me to the Gospel of John in chapter 1, we find here that this is no new message at all. When the Bible introduces us in John chapter 1, verse 1, when the Bible introduces the person of Jesus Christ, he is quite clear as to who Jesus is. Notice John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, 
And without him was not anything made that was made. In him, that is Christ the Word, was life, and the life was the light of men. So I say to us, where is life? I'll tell you where life is. It is in Jesus Christ. That's where life is. You see, uh, we go uh, then later, if you go over, over with me in the Gospel of John in chapter 10. In John chapter 10, if we go down to verse number 15, Jesus Christ is speaking here. And notice what he says in verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life that it might that I might take it again no man taketh it from me but I lay down uh, but I lay it down of myself I have the power to lay it down and I have power to take it again this commandment have I received of my father notice here he says I lay down my life that I might take it again he came here, he says, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Notice verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and uh, scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep. And I am known of mine as the father knoweth me. Even so I uh, know I the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So the idea of all the words of this life, what are they talking about? They're talking about Jesus Christ who laid down his life for the sheep. You remember when Paul was testifying before King Agrippa? He was imprisoned by the religious people. And uh, King Agrippa says, well, uh, why, well, what have you done? What is your response to all those accusations? And Paul basically gave his testimony and says, Jesus Christ has called me. He has made me a minister and a witness to turn the people from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to the power of God. That was the message of Peter. When, or Paul, when Paul was asked, so Paul, what are you doing in this life? What is your ministry? What has God called you to do? And Paul was very clear. I'm here to preach and teach Jesus Christ. He said himself, woe is me if I preach not Jesus Christ. Earlier, back in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, you remember when they were told not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus Christ? You remember what Peter said? He says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The truth is there is no other message that tells us the meaning of life in this world but the message of Jesus Christ. I want you to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We talk about the gospel, and we should. We should mention the gospel quite a bit because that means the good news. It is interesting that the irrational critics wants to say, oh, that's good news. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear about how somebody can receive forgiveness of sin. We don't want to hear about how someone can have eternal life. We don't want to be hear about how someone can be made a better person through Christ. We want to hear about that. That's irrational. Haven't we been lived long enough to look and see that all the programs that are out there that are made up by churches and that are made up by governments where they have, oh, we have this program and this program over here and this drug-free zone and this over here and none of those ever work. How many millions of dollars has the world has to invest in programs that do not work? And Jesus Christ is not preached. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible tells us exactly what the gospel is. What is the gospel? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of, of all that which I also received, how that Christ, here's the gospel, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures. 
And he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. He goes on to say, if you go down with me to verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Paul talks about his life as Saul. You remember, he used to imprison Christians. God changed his life. Verse 10, he says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. Remember when Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, he says, I marvel that ye are so soon shaken and removed from him that hath called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What is another gospel? I'll tell you what another gospel. It's all messages in the world that have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Let me tell, tell you how you can turn over a new leaf and make yourself a better person and kind of, uh, you know, get your life together. And the truth is no one will ever be able to get their lives together without the Lord Jesus Christ. He says... That other gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul says, if you turn with me to the book of Galatians, we ask, where does this gospel come from? Did Paul come up with that message of the gospel? Did Paul just have a dream one day and he says, oh, yeah, I mean, let's, that sounds wonderful. No, Galatians chapter 1, in verse number 8, the, Paul describes here, he says, Verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which he have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any preach, uh, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I speak uh, or please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Hey, Pastor, why do you stand up and preach? Are you trying to... Please, men, you're standing up there because you must have an agenda. And I tell you, there is no agenda because the majority of the people that I share the gospel with will reject it and mock it. So if you think that I'm preaching because I want to please myself, you're completely wrong. I preach the gospel message because it's the truth. I do not please men. And if I seek to please men, I should not be the servant of God. Verse 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which we preach of, of me is not after man. Verse 12, for neither received it I of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. What is the gospel message? It is the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. So when in Acts chapter 5, they were told, didn't we not straightly command you not to teach and preach in his name? And you remember what Peter says. We should obey God rather than men. That statement was quite simple. As you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, let's consider the words of Jesus Christ himself. He said in Matthew 20, 28, The Son of Man, speaking of himself, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for all. In John 12, 24, Jesus was teaching and he said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it, die, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He was speaking of himself. And then he said in verse 32, and if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. That's what he said. Then when he would be lifted up on the cross, at that moment he would draw all men unto him. And so the apostles that come afterwards in the book of Acts, now that Jesus Christ has sent it up into heaven, the apostles that come, what are they preaching? They're looking back and they're saying, Jesus Christ says, come unto me. I am the answer. In John 3, 14, Jesus says, as Moses Lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
You see, when we read that expression in Acts chapter 5, go and speak all the words of this life. What were they going to preach about? Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. We ask ourselves, what is then the message of the gospel, right? It's Jesus died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again. We're go about going to baptize a few folks after the service here at the end. And what is baptism about? It pictures the death. As the water crosses your body, it represents the death of Christ. As the person goes into the water, it represents the burial. And as we come out of the water, it represents the resurrection. And so there is a picture of the message of the gospel in this baptism. And that is the message that is declared. But we ask ourselves, what, what happened on the cross? What is it that happened on the cross? And I'll tell you what happened. You remember the words of Jesus Christ. He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they then he said a few words, but he said at the conclusion before he gave up the ghost, he says, it is finished. Finished. What was finished? You see, we think about all the words of this life. What, what is the message of the Bible? What is the one central message that the Bible declares? I'll tell you what that message is. It is that the message that man rebelled against God and sin, and because of his sin, there was a curse upon man, and so now every person is born with a sinful tendency, a natural instinct to do the wrong thing. And that is, by the way, comes naturally to you and I. And that's how we are born. We are born with a sin nature. We we sill willfully against God and the law of God is written in our hearts so that we know when we are guilty of breaking His law. And so we stand here as guilty sinners before a holy God and the Bible says that the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And so as we stand as sinners before a holy God, we are guilty. We are under the wrath of God. We deserve an eternal punishment in a place called hell because of our sin. And we love our sin as much as you may try to deny it. You love your sin. That is your nature. And that's why God in His love, according to John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when Jesus Christ was on this earth, He lived for 33 and a half years and constantly repeating to His disciples, I'm going to be betrayed in the hands of sinners. I'm going to be put to death. And uh, the disciples in a sense rejected that. They didn't want to see that. But yet Jesus Christ was betrayed. He was taken in the hands of sinners. He he was placed upon a cross and he died on the cross. We say, what happened when he died on the cross? As it was pictured all throughout the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were bringing their offering and their sacrifices, it was a picture of what was going to happen one day when Jesus Christ would come. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, all those earlier sacrifices, they could not save from sin. Only Jesus can save from sin. And so when Jesus was set up on the cross, what happened? The Bible says, God hath made him Christ to be sin for us. Did you hear that? God hath made him Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, understand what happened there. It was more that it's not that Jesus Christ died and was a martyr, rejected of the world, although those things are true. But the Bible says when he died on the cross, in that moment, he became sin for us. And what happened on the cross of Calvary is de described for us in Galatians chapter 1. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, nailing it to His cross and took it out of the way. And so you say, what happened on the cross? What's the significance of the cross of Calvary? I'll tell you what the significance is of Calvary. Is that on the cross of Calvary, it was not just Jesus Christ that was hanging there. I was hanging there. My sin was hanging there. All the filth in my life, all the wrong thoughts, all the wrong motive, all the wrong behavior, every filth that... Every man has ever committed was hanging there on the, on the cross of Calvary and Jesus Christ became sin for us. He became sin for you. He himself knew no sin. 
but he came sin for us to do what? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How can we be righteous? How can you be righteous in the sight of a holy God? Only through Jesus Christ. He alone is righteous. We are not. That's the words of this life. And so I tell you today as you're standing here, your life has meaning. You're not just an animal strolling through this life, running in a rat race, and then one day you die and that's it. No. Your life has meaning, so much meaning that God sent His only begotten Son to die to pay for your sin debt. And He desires to give you eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You want eternal life? It can only come through Jesus Christ. The righteousness of men is filthy rags. The only righteousness that is worthy of God's acceptance is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So as we read here and we ask ourselves, what is, to us personally, all the words of this life, do you know why you're here? Do you know what life is about? I'll tell you why you're here. You're here to bring glory to God. You have purpose and meaning. So much meaning that God loves you and in His love He died to pay for your sin debt. God became man that He might die for you. But then, what do these words mean with regard to the church? What is the church? What does the church do? And I'll tell you what the church does. The church preaches the gospel. All the words of this life. We have a message. That message is about the Lord Jesus Christ that can redeem sinners just like all of us and change our lives. That's the message of the gospel. 